In my view, leadership success uh, starts with personal success, and uh, personal success is being happy, being happy in your own skin. Uh, but when it comes to leadership of, of people, it's actually finding the best in people and uh, developing people and uh, just making them feel great about who they are uh, through the development that you assist them with. So that's how I would define success as a leader. My parents uh, were very special and uh, I consider them as my role models in different ways. My mother had a father who didn't believe in educating girls. I'm told he was a very nice person, but he just didn't believe that uh, girls had to be educated, they had to get married. And uh, so she ran away from home to get education. She went to a Catholic convent. Uh, that's how she got her education. She became a primary school teacher. And she didn't give up there. She actually tried through Dameline. She got a matric when I was at medical school. And she had such a work ethic. Uh, so she is such a role model for me. And my father didn't get much education. He had to leave school early uh, because the father died early. And he had to take care of his siblings and cousins, you know. But in spite of that, he really believed in education. He invested a lot, a lot uh, on us. He looked for good schools for us. And um, he actually did well for himself. He prided himself of being an entrepreneur. He was a small, pain, he had a small painting contractor. He actually bought property in the few areas in the country where blacks were allowed to own property, specifically Africans. So I, had, I have a lot of respect for both my parents. So those are my true role models because our value system is aligned, which is very important for me. I, I would find it difficult to have a role model whose value system I don't understand and or whose value system that is not aligned to mine. So that's where it all began. It's interesting that uh, it's a long story how I got to Fryhead, but I'm very shy, very, very shy, very quiet and uh, it would be very difficult for me to just stand in front of people. And it's been like that for a long time. But at Fryhead, uh, for some reason, I got into being the chairman of the debating committee. Uh, I became the chairman of the entertainment committee. So when we had the 1976 riots, uh, we were taken in by police for questioning because we happened to be having an entertainment uh, evening that night uh, at uh, high school and I was the chairman of that uh, entertainment committee. And then some people threw stones and what have you. So, but anyway, uh, that's uh, what I recall about Freehead. So I guess it um, ignited uh, some leadership uh, qualities that I didn't think I had. And uh, then I wanted to go to medical school. I always had wanted to be a doctor, a medical doctor from the age of four. And uh, there are two people really that had an influence in that. I had a half sister who was a nurse, a professional nurse. She is the type of person who came home and told you all the stories at work. And the doctor seemed to have the final word. Quiet as I was, shy as I was, I just liked having the final word, you know? <laughs> and um, the other instance is when the late Dr. Vusik Kabashi came to treat my dad, my dad didn't like to go to hospital. So when he wasn't well, he would call the doctor and Dr. Kabashi was his doctor. Uh, I was four, I couldn't go to school because I had to take care of my dad. He wasn't well. And uh, so came this doctor. He had a beautiful car. He had his doctor's bag. He seemed to be in control of things. And uh, he was in charge of his destiny. So that's the memory I have, and he made, him, he made my dad feel better. So I, I, I just decided that's what I'm gonna be when I grow up. I went to medical school, and uh, Bantu education didn't prepare you for varsity, and uh, so it was a shock. Uh, for the first time I failed, and that was humbling. And I'm, I think I'm a better person because of that, because I'd never failed before. And um, it was a, a beautiful journey in that uh, I met people that were very similar work ethic. In some way in your career, especially your profession, I mean the profession that you choose, you tend to find people that 
have a similar way of thinking. So it became like a home away from home. And when I qualified, actually I got married when I just completed fourth year. I got our son when I was doing fifth year. So by the time I qualified, actually 95% of the people at medical school never thought they would be GPs. Everyone aspires to specialize. I also aspire to specialize. But when I completed uh, my medical degree, our son was one, and there was no way I would actually go back to hospital uh, after doing my medical uh, officer training. So I had to go and uh, open my own practice because I was in control of the hours. Yes, it was long hours, but you slept at home every day. Unlike when you're in hospital, when you're specializing where the hours are long, you don't come back home, and that just wouldn't work uh, for my son, my family. So I've always prioritized family. I'm very driven, but uh, certain things are just a, a no-no, like family comes first and everything else uh, comes after that. So I opened the practice, my first love, and maybe my only love, that is uh, medicine, and uh, I loved it. It's just the best thing I ever did. Uh, you drove to your practice, it felt like your extended family, you drove home and you're happy. You actually felt I made a difference. Um, not so much because you gave Panado penicillin, but because you just felt you could reach into the people that you met. Uh, that's one thing I loved about medicine. I'm a one-on-one -on -one person rather than addressing people. So you just had that relationship and you owned it, you know? You had some students uh, from high school who would come just for advice, you know? And those are some of the most special ones where you actually felt you connected and you felt maybe their direction in life is going to change because of that conversation. So uh, that was the best time of my life. So I love my practice and uh, my husband and I have always been entrepreneurial and hardworking. So when, we, when I, ran, I ran my practice, he was running his own accounting practice and uh, we decided we need another business. So we opened a bakery next to my practice. Uh, so it was a busy area, my practice was busy, the bakery was busy. Uh, I happened to be affected by crime. I was held at gunpoint outside my practice. I happened to have money. So it just changed the whole home away from home uh, experience where I actually felt exposed and uh, I changed direction, I lost the passion. Uh, I sold the practice, sold the house in the township, which is a pity because I really believe, yes, with the Group Areas Act, uh, the ending thereof, you could live wherever you wanted to live. But there was something special about being amongst people that you could inspire, just being yourself, just living your life. Uh, so, but I had to because I wasn't feeling safe anymore. We had to move as a family. So I opened a practice in town and it wasn't the same. It was just people with flu that, uh, you know, you drive home and you say, if I didn't come to work, I wouldn't have been missed. And uh, then I thought, you know, I wasn't born a doctor. I studied and became one. I can stop doing this because it's important for me to find meaning in what I do. Because you choose to do what you do, especially if you have education. Education gives you that privilege. So I decided, okay, if I remove the disqualification, all I have is a metric. So what it entails then is going back to school. Uh, I toyed between doing something in accounting, because I always wanted to be in business. I was in business already in different shapes. And um, yeah, I didn't understand the financial statements. And you know, <laughs> I thought, I mean, it can be that difficult, you know? So I decided to go to business school. Uh, that's how I ended up when uh, my husband got a job in Pretoria, in telecom. Uh, we originally from Devon, so we had to relocate uh, to Johannesburg. Uh, then I, I took that opportunity to register at the Vitz Business School for an MBA. Uh, that was quite educational for me. It was very different. Um, I believe uh, other doctors might disagree with me that uh, we tend to be quite myopic. You're trained to actually drill down to a specific area uh, of study. Uh, which uh, is good but also bad in some areas. So going to business school, though it's actually an inch deep and a mile wild, it's actually helpful in just broadening the way you look at life, uh, understanding a little bit of each. 
Uh, so that was quite empowering for me. I needed that to be able to get out of the medical profession and do something else. I was lucky to be assisted by a girl called Patsy David. Uh, she introduced me to HSBC. It was a bit difficult, I was 40 and I was a doctor. It's funny, it's fine when you have BA music or anything else, but if you are a doctor, they tend to put you in a box. That's all you are, that's all you can be. So actually I got a break through Patsy David and uh, Richard Boomer, who took a chance on me and uh, I worked in corporate finance. Uh, I learned so much, just putting a deal together and uh, also just understanding what makes a good transaction a good transaction. You know, uh, it was a valuable time, I was there for two years. I could have stayed for longer, but uh, with uh, corporate finance you actually have peak seasons where you work very hard and then it gets very quiet. When it was quiet it didn't make sense to me why I would be there because I was there to learn. So that's when I decided to come out and uh, do my own thing which is a pursue in a career in, in business. I've had a lot of people that have influenced my life. I'm very lucky in that way. Uh, I started going out with my husband when we were still kids, and uh, we share a lot in common, especially the value system. And uh, he actually had an impact, um, an impact in who I became because we are quite close, we've always been. And um, I also met uh, quite a few people uh, just to fast track to the transaction uh, that I did with the uh, Aspen. Uh, I was introduced to Aspen through, it's a chain of people. There was Kumo Shonyane who worked for Investec at the time. Uh, there was Andy Leith, uh, I had met them for something else, but Andy Leith, uh, it happened that at the time, uh, they were looking for be a partner for Aspen and uh, Andy Leith introduced me to Stephen Saad and uh, it's, uh, it's actually interesting how being actually at the right place at the right time and being ready uh, makes the whole difference and uh, that's how I got involved in the Aspen uh, transaction. Uh, not only am I very grateful for that because obviously there was wealth created uh, but also just working with Stephen Saad, Gus Attridge, Stavros and all the, I mean, the, the colleagues within the Aspen board was very special. Special because someone like a Stephen Saad is very humble, down to earth, extremely bright, very hardworking. Just to work with a person that is that accessible is so empowering. It just makes you humble yourself, you know, and he works so hard. People don't know that. And uh, there come it, it came a time when uh, our son passed away, that was 2012, and uh, I saw a side of Steve that other people don't know, very, very sensitive, and uh, he, he became more like someone I would call a younger brother that I never had, and uh, you might know that uh, he then put together a long uh, ride for Sifiso to raise funds, uh, to actually make sure that uh, the health of children in this country is better off because of the initiative that he did uh, on behalf of our son's name. And uh, that was called the Sisongasana Trust. And uh, how do you recognize someone who can do that for you? I mean, he rode 243 kilometers in a very, very difficult terrain in the Western Cape. And as a family, we are so indebted to him you know. So those uh, are just some of the people that uh, have touched my life and uh, made me a better person through the different things that they did for me and my family. There are certain values that drive our family and uh, I always say I see business as a family. For me the thing that I understand the most is family because I'm a mother of family and wherever I go, whether it's in business, whatever business that I own, I see that as an extension of a family. And one of the things that are important with families is that the core of who you are is your value system. So as the family, we have three values that are more important than anything else. It's integrity, which is sacrosanct. It's uh, respect for self and respect for other people, and it's passion in what you do. Uh, we work very, very hard, not just my husband and I, but our daughter, uh, you just, that's the only thing we really know, to just work hard. 
So it's important that you find something that you're passionate about because when you work that hard and you're passionate about something, it doesn't feel like hard work. It feels like work, of course, but not hard work. So in every situation I find myself, I find it quite difficult to work with people that don't have integrity. I, I, I would rather have someone who needs some development in terms of skills, uh, but has integrity. You know, I, I can live with that. And um, yeah, and I find it's easier to develop people that uh, you share the same, where the value system is, is aligned. Uh, it's important for business, I believe, uh, because um, it's a marriage. You know, business partnerships are like a marriage, you know, and uh, that's why you have to have a similar value system in my view. What I've realized, because I've actually dabbled in different things, uh, meeting different people from different uh, professions, is that people relate well to authenticity. They need to know what they are dealing with. It doesn't matter what their value system is, but they need to know this is who you are. You need to be fair. It's so important as a leader to be seen to be fair because they may not like what you say, they may not like you as a person, but as long as they know what they're dealing with and you're fair to them, then you actually it's easier to then mold them and have a, a shared vision with them. So those things, and obviously everyone wants to be respected, you know, starting with yourself. If you respect yourself, people find it easier to respect you. So those are the qualities that I find make it easier to lead people. Sometimes you have to let people go uh, because uh, there is just a cultural misfit. In my view, culture trumps everything. Strategy, it's, culture is very important. That's the core of uh, what you're trying to create. So I've had those few instances where I had to let people go because they were actually not fitting into the organization. And sometimes you run the risk of actually changing the whole culture because you allow those elements that are not uh, aligned with the culture of the organization. I'm a very ambitious person and uh, I always have dreams and uh, I work hard to achieve the dreams. And uh, when I achieve a dream, I create another dream, you know? Because when you're working towards something, then it keeps you inspired because you want to achieve that. And um, failure actually makes me want to do more uh, because I'm always proving to myself that I can, you know? Uh, I think it's starting off uh, not being very confident uh, maybe it's starting off with our history as a country, where as a child I used to, uh, we lived in Westville. Uh, we were affected directly by the Group Areas Act. And uh, I used to walk home and there would be bus stops that there was a waiting area for blacks and one for uh, whites. It used to be called non-white non and white, European, and those things. And as a child, there was that thing that you didn't quite understand it why you are less. Because you look in the mirror and you think you're okay, but surely there's something because you are treated as less. You are not an, an entity, if you like what you know what I mean. So I think what that did for me, it made me want to prove to myself and nobody else that I'm okay. You know? So even when I, I wasn't uh, achieving what I want to achieve, when I failed at medical school, I had to prove to me that I can be. So that keeps me sometimes awake at night because I have these dreams, I create these dreams because I still have to prove to myself that I can, that I can be anything I choose to be. One of my dreams that I created along the way was getting a doctorate. And um, obviously life happens, you know, you're working hard, you're trying to create wealth for your family. But I still had this selfish dream that I need to prove to myself that I can get this doctorate. So when I got it in 2014, I mean, I was old, I was 50 something, but it was so important to me because I'd proven to myself that I can. Now I'm converting my thesis to a book. Now that is not just proving to myself that I can, but it's actually reaching out to younger people because we're all so busy. You wish you could mentor more people, more women and boys, by the way, but uh, you haven't got enough time. 
So I actually thought if I put the life stories of the women that I interviewed for the thesis in a book, at least then it will be accessible. I can take this book to wherever and then, I mean, young people can read the book and see themselves in the stories that are in the book. So those are just some of the things that uh, drive me. I haven't got time for this book, but it's important that I do that, even if it's the last thing I do, you know. So much has changed in the past 20 years. And uh, I, I truly believe that you have a generation that hasn't been exposed to people like the Mandelas. They read about them, but they haven't been exposed to a, a Mandela that was active, that was leading the country. And uh, one of those uh, leadership qualities are just integrity, you know, where you feel I can trust this person. And uh, we have a lot of people in the country, we have a lot of leaders who have integrity uh, that can be trusted and uh, we just need them to be accessible to the younger generation uh, to just confirm to them that we have a beautiful country. We do certain things in a way that is not the greatest, but still that doesn't take away the fact that the country has a lot of good leaders in different pockets and different sectors uh, of the country. And it's important that they shine through to make sure to the younger generation that Integrity is not old-fashioned. Integrity is what defines who you are, and it's important to carry that at all times. One of the things I've learned over time is that in life you learn, you earn, and you give back. And it doesn't have to be in that order, but those are just some of the things that you have to do all the time. You never stop learning, and in my view, you never stop earning because, uh, like I've said before, I intend to work till I can't work anymore because I don't have a life <laughs> to work. And uh, giving back is very important. Uh, giving back doesn't really mean you need to have money. It helps if you do, uh, because sometimes people do need money just to get by, uh, especially for education, which my family believes in. Uh, but sometimes people just need advice. Sometimes people just need to be told that they are okay. Uh, they need to be told that they can be fine. Like if you look at my story, uh, I remember one of the ladies that I interviewed for my thesis said, so you became a doctor, was your par one of your parents a doctor? And I laughed because I just thought my father didn't have even metric. Uh, my mother struggled to get uh, the education that she had. But that didn't define who I became because it's up to you, you know? You empower yourself and education is the best way to empower yourself. So it's important, uh, that's why my family, uh, CISWE, is leading the drive to actually invest in education, to start education that is empowering uh, for children, uh, up to the education of uh, teachers. So my message to young women is that it really starts with you. You need to invest in yourself. And when you invest in yourself, you don't stop. You don't say, I'm 50 now, I'm 60. You just invest in yourself all the time. Uh, because when you do that, you become a better person. And uh, one of the other things that I've realized is just the influence that women have for their families. It, it's, it's interesting that more often than not, the mother tends to have a bigger impact on what the children become. It doesn't matter what the father is, it's still important. But as a mother, if education is the pillar of your value or your ethic, then you'll find that uh, children are more likely to be educated, are more likely to see education for what it is, which is uh, quite an empowering thing. So as women, we do have that responsibility because uh, though men are supposed to be the stronger sex, uh, we, I really believe that we, we tend to be the pillar uh, of families. Uh, I'm just a bit concerned in that uh, society tends to undervalue women, not just in this country, but the world over. I was listening to news uh, recently, and I think for the first 10 minutes, they were talking about women that were killed uh, by either their son or their husband or boyfriend. It just says to me that as a society, we don't put enough value to women. And uh, that then goes back to our boys. 
What are we teaching our boys? How can we change it around for our boys to actually see us as partners, as uh, people that have the same value as they do, different, yes, but still equal in terms of value. So what I can say to young women is that respect yourself, empower yourself, because when you do that, then you won't stay in relationships that don't work. You won't stay in relationships that make you feel less about yourself eh, because no one has a right to make you feel less about yourself. But also, I find that when you are ambitious as a woman, it's important to find a partner that is just as ambitious. So the partner you choose is very important because when he's ambitious, you can be whatever you choose to be. You won't be threatened because he's doing well himself. Whereas because of the way society says to men that you have to support your family, you have to be better than your wife or girlfriend, that's part of the problem because you don't really have to. It's a partnership. Sometimes someone does better and sometimes it's the other person and it's okay. So those are the things that I believe as women of all generations, we need to instill in the sons, the grandsons, that your wife, your girlfriend is your partner. Sometimes she'll do better. Sometimes she'll bring more money home. That's fine. Just be the best you can as a person. Not to beat anyone, but just the best you can as a person. So those are the things that I really believe as the older generation we need to impart to the younger generation. One of the things that I believe as a country we can do better is just stop throwing stones at other people. You know, we have issues. We always have. We try and deal with them. I, I really believe as a country we are very resilient and there is a positive from each one of us. Uh, you might be unhappy about what a uh, government has done today, tomorrow, but I truly believe for someone like me, who actually didn't exist pre-1994, one of the most liberating things that I had in my lifetime is to be seen as an entity, as a citizen. People have no idea what that means. For me, that is the most important thing. Bigger than money, bigger than any success, just to have the dignity to be recognized as an equal human being. So I think it's important for people to understand that because when there are problems, we see them differently simply because of what it means where we were and where we are today. And where we are today, I think it's very important for each person and each corporate leader or any leader for that matter, community or otherwise, to focus on what you as a person can do to make this country better than it is. To focus on how we can work together. And when you've raised children, there's something interesting in that more often than not, children respond better to being told what they're good at. Positive messaging is better than negative, me negative messaging. So one of the things where we need to focus, and I'm happy that there are quite a few initiatives where business and government are working together uh, to actually make this country a better place. There are so many that I could count. And I think we need to focus on those. And uh, it's okay to actually say things are not going well. How can we make them better and focus on doing that rather than being the, the most negative PR you can be as corporate leaders outside this country, which is what I find sometimes when I go outside this country that we as South Africans are the ones who actually are talking so ill of this country. Of course we have problems and so do other countries. You know, there are so many other countries that have problems. The best way of dealing with them I might want so-and-so to be president, it's, but I don't have the power to decide who the president is going to be. But what I do have a power to do is to make a difference wherever I am. You know, one of the things that as a family we did, my husband and I used to give back a lot in haphazard fashion, you know, bursary for this child, giving pocket money for university students. Then one day we said, 
how are we going to pass this on if it's ill-defined? Let's form a trust. Because one of the most important things to pass on, if you educate your kids, they don't really need your money, you know? What they do need, though, is the value system. And part of that is the ethos of giving back. The trust does just that. Uh, we've just uh, finished uh, constructing a community center in some small rural area where my husband comes from, Ekobo. Uh, we named it after our late son, Spesun Masana Community Center. And the objective of that center is to offer computer training for the community, offer adult base, basic education, uh, expose them to training and crafts, and also expose them to markets to actually take uh, those uh, uh, craft um, uh, products that they put together. But uh, we've also been quite strong in offering bursaries. And we offer bursaries for the accounting students because my husband is from that uh, uh, side of uh, the sector, uh, medical students uh, through Mtombo Youth Development Fund. Uh, we've now started uh, offering um, uh, bursaries for actual science students, for IT students, and uh, also engineering students. So uh, my message is that make a difference wherever you are with whatever you have. That's key. And everyone can make a positive difference, I believe.